Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. A long time ago, I had a friend who told me that by merely looking at a photograph of Lee J. Cobb, you would see something that reminds you of action movies. He is a man who enjoys thrilling movie scenes, as seen in his classics that today define his persona in Hollywood, from those quite explosive on-screen facial anger to his scary vocals. This talented actor showed perfect character in the diversity of roles he played, something he nursed as a child and perfected on screen. How Lee J. Cobb got his tremendous money from? I want you to know, my viewers, how much I appreciate you. Without your support, these videos wouldn't be possible. Thank you for those who hit the thanks button. Lee J. Cobb, I would say, is one of those great talents that grew up looking for ways to achieve their career dream and luckily find themselves excelling in it. He found himself famous and made money, but I'm not sure of fulfilment, not with the way he ended. Each time I open the archives and look at some of the movies that made Cobb prominent, I always remember his acting style. The thing that interests me most about his character is the swag he introduced to his acting. Those who know this gentleman off-screen would tell you that Cobb is not an intimidating character, unlike what he portrayed in his movies. He just had a way of swinging his angry mood on, with a rare expressionless intensity that kept his audience at the edge of their seat. The Twelve Angry Men performance readily comes to mind. For the epic death of a salesman, analysts describe his performance as the aged, crushed salesman as one of his remarkable outings that would not be forgotten in a hurry. Some say he made his audience shiver if he has to, complemented with that croaky voice that reminds you of powerful masculinity. Maybe I should say he achieved fame showing as the action man you must not mess with, and he was perfect in that, in words and actions. The great Lee J. Cobb did his best in showbiz to give himself an identity that will continue to excite most of us, more so when we carefully examine his highly energetic film career, which spanned almost 40 years. He is not just a dynamic talent, Cobb's name remains evergreen for many reasons. Hollywood movie fans will remember him for his part in On the Waterfront, while the television audience talks more about The Virginian Show and several Western TV series. Sadly, he is no longer with us, but while we say farewell to Lee J. Cobb, who left his fans wanting at the middle age of 64, it is not out of place to reflect on the life and time of this screen hero, especially his position as a Hollywood actor. Is Lee J. Cobb the greatest dramatic actor in history? Arthur Miller tends to suggest so when he placed him top among the actors he ever saw. He was not mincing words, though, as facts speak. For instance, his repeat of the Willie role in 1966 for television was an absolute breakthrough in studio drama. Everyone thought that his TV performance was better and more creative than the stage version of the production. Although stage enthusiasts may disagree with the argument, Cobb was no doubt a big name in the entertainment industry of his era. Some even argued that Lee J. Cobb may have been the biggest TV western star of his time. Recall that he had a major role in the first four seasons of The Virginian from 1962 to 1965, Appearing as Judge Garth, Cobb influenced millions of TV viewers and turned himself into what he later described as living a routine life on the TV range, something his audience truly cherished. The way people talk about his stage and TV performances, one would wonder if he did not show in mainstream Hollywood where he even began his career, with over 80 films to his credit. His talent did not go unnoticed. He was recognised with three times Emmy Award nominations for Outstanding Single Performance by an Actor. Even when fate took him away, Cobb was retrospectively inducted into the American Theatre Hall of Fame. I hear he decided to become an actor when he was nearly 17 years old. It was not an easy decision for young and handsome Cobb because he had to struggle to convince his mother that the career was worthwhile and satisfying. But like most 19th century mothers, Mama wanted his son to leverage the accounting profession so that he would have enough money and a good reputation in society. But I was stubborn, he once said, explaining how he got started. Cobb was born Leo Jacobi in New York City in 1911 to Jewish parents. 
traced to Russian and Romanian descent. As a child, Cobb saw much of Wilkins Avenue, close to Crotona Park in the Bronx, where he was raised by his parents, Benjamin Jacob and Kate. It was not clear what inspired young Cobb into the entertainment industry as a teenager, but he was sure of the career he wanted for himself. After several arguments and persuasion failed to convince his mother, Cobb said he absconded from home and headed to Hollywood, where he made an initial unsuccessful outing. He worked with Borominovich's Harmonica Rascals as a musician and got a bit role in a brief film that has the group performing. It was not also clear why Cobb added the name Lee to his name as a stage name. At this time he was learning to be a concert violinist and was a virtuoso on the harmonica, winning competitions and a little fame before a broken wrist quenched his idea of a musical career. But the atmosphere was also dull for him because he could not attract a regular engagement that would keep him afloat, so he found his way back to New York two months later. Back home he was marketing for radios while also learning accounting at New York University at night, temporarily appeasing his mother. But while he attends evening classes for accounting, he hunted for acting jobs every day. But every aspect of accounting was like a mirage for him because his mind was fixed on something else. He later stated that he didn't get very far because he hated accounting. He was still passionate about showbiz and nursed the idea continually before doing a second missionary journey back to California. This time he joined the Pasadena Playhouse, where he had a minor role. Cobb was 23 when he made his film debut in two episodes of the 1934 The Vanishing Shadow film series, before identifying with Manhattan-based group theatre. Among his earliest stage shows are the original Broadway productions of the Clifford Odette's dramas Waiting for Lefty in 1935 and Golden Boy two years after. When he joined the Army Air Forces in 1943, it was reported that he wanted to become a pilot, but that dream would not stand because he was dispersed to a radio unit. Within that period, he was cast in Moss Hart's This is the Army for six months. Most of his productions were so interesting, like his golden boy role, which he repeated in its movie version of 1939. It was not until 1949 that he became a classic hero in Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman by playing the role of Willie Loman. Then he has been discharged from the military service. To keep himself up and running in his passion, Cobb returned to Hollywood and continued doing what he knows how to do best, appearing in several movie roles. At some point things became so tough for Cobb, a writer described it as a period of great frustration. It was within that period that he was told about the death of a salesman script by Elia Kazan. That production was more than a breakthrough for Cobb because it did so much to his life and career. He later stated that it did not take time after doing the production when he realised that he had no life in him. There was no living until I played Willie Loman, he was quoted. Willie Loman, he said, is part of his existence. Most of us will remember Cobb as Johnny Friendly in Kazan's On the Waterfront in 1954, and that remarkable Twelve Angry Men role in 1957 that he made himself the angriest of all the angry men. We saw that crucial scene in On the Waterfront where the former boxer Terry Malloy portrayed by Marlon Brando, testifies against Cobb's character gangster Johnny Friendly. The facial expression on Friendly's face when he is accused is one of the most soaring, destructive rages that would ever be made. Of course, no one could do that better than a man like Lee J. Cobb. Cobb continued to perform excellently in diverse film and stage roles and soon embraced fully the Western TV series. Perhaps very closer to an Oscar after earning a nomination for the 1958 screen version of The Brothers Karamazov. Sometime in 1940, Cobb met and married Helen Beverly, a Yiddish theatre and film actress. Their union produced two offspring, a boy, Vincent Cobb, and a girl actress, Julie Cobb. But that marriage ended as a result of a divorce. Cobb would later marry a school teacher, Mary Hirsch. The union similarly grew two children because Hirsch came to the marriage with a three-year-old son from a previous relationship, plus a son they had in 1960, and their marriage continued. A very remarkable thing about this gruff, rugged physique, plus the frown and the rumbling voice movie character, is what someone said was fateful testimony in the middle of the 1950s. 
It was not clear why and when things turned that sour for Cobb, but he was said to have testified as a supportive witness before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Cobb acknowledged being a member of the Communist Party for a brief period in New York because of the contacts he had while working with the group theatre, but noted that he left the party and was no longer appearing in any of its gatherings or related activities. His reason for departure from the union was because of the overall pattern of submission demanded of the members. On why he changed his mind and decided to appear and testify at HUAC after two years of refusal, Cobb said that he needed to work and earn money as things were very tough for him at the time. At the sitting he had named twenty people he knew as former members of the Communist Party. In his words, the HUAC did a deal with me because I was pretty much worn down, no money, I couldn't borrow, even as he was burdened with the responsibility of offsetting his bills and that of his children. He took time to consider the pros and the cons and wondered why he was subjecting himself and his loved ones to hardship for something that was not worth dying for before deciding to do it. I decided it wasn't worth dying for, and if this gesture was the way of getting out of the penitentiary, I'd do it. I had to be employable again, he was quoted to have said. Critics say it's unlike his tough movie character, appears very tough in movies but very simple and cautious off-screen. Reacting to his confession, Arthur Miller, who would not testify against former friends, said he could not help thinking of Lee J. Cobb as more a pathetic victim than a villain, a big blundering actor, who he said simply wanted to appear in movies and never bothered to think about any form of heroism. Recall that he was reported to have supported Progressive Party candidate Henry A. Wallace in the 1948 U.S. presidential poll, that testimony was a shocking twist in his life and for fans, with lots of questions begging for an answer. While some of us were still digesting the epic revelation at the time, it did not take long before we heard another. This time it was Cobb's health. He was reported to have suffered a substantial heart attack that nearly ended his life. The information available shows that the incident drained him physically, emotionally and financially, with some saying that it left him with a huge debt. After that period and around the 1960s, Cobb lived a life he labelled as a new life, without much hullabaloo. Of course, no actor will forget productions that gave him or her fame, the reason Cobb described the Brothers Karamazov production as one of his favourites, plus the TV movies Twelve Angry Men, Don Quixote and the well-paid The Virginian series. Before his sudden departure from the scene, Cobb starred in the King Lear stage production, proving that he was ready to offer more to the entertainment world with a wonderful stage performance after he went back to stage shows. The play was offered by the Repertory Theatre of Lincoln Centre, providing another avenue for a critical assessment of this great talent. Even though it was his first time doing the Shakespeare role in his professional career, Cobb put up an amazing performance that won him a standing ovation at the end of the act, with a movie analyst describing his performance as the finest performance in a distinguished career. Cobb, however, did not think it was OK to compare his performance in Lear with that of Willie Loman, and was not willing to talk about certain things at that point in his life, but insisted that Loman is a half-beaker, and not good to be compared with Lear's full overflowing beaker of poetry and emotion. He stated that a difference to mention would be that in the production of Lear, there is a challenge to continual growth, but such a challenge was non-existent in the former because there is no such thing as perfection. Remembering how it was back then, Cobb did not believe that Death of a Salesman had any social significance as a play, as has been postulated. The Miller drama is simply a love relationship between a father and his son, woven around the shortcomings, weak disarrays and strengths of a particular man, as such, in the words of Lee J. Cobb, Willie Loman is nobody's hero, but we are all his orphans. Kazan had joined Miller, the young playwright, to produce the play about a crushed-down roving salesman that gradually descend into delusions and hopelessness. Soon after that production, Miller told the public that he had always had Cobb in mind as the central character while preparing the script for Willie Loman, and in all likelihood Kazan authorised his choice. That production is still considered one of the finest dramas of the 20th century. 
Lee J. Cobb died of a heart attack in 1976 when he turned 64. Hollywood had been always a taut place. Why Hollywood treated Oscar Werner like a piece of meat? Watch this video now!